Thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited um, and honored to be on stage with three of the greatest kind of experts on this region who know it quite intimately. So we're in for a treat and looking at a tough question, an old question, um, to see if there's a new take on this. So before we start, we um, are going to poll the audience on a question. If you could turn your attention to the television screens on either side of the stage, um, the question that I want all of you to think about is, which of these options would be the most effective solution to Afghanistan's current problems? A, negotiations between the Afghan government and the Ghani administration with the Taliban. B, ensuring free and fair presidential elections in 2019. Or C, complete withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan. So take a minute and think about this. And to join the polling session, uh, please text Future of War 2018 to 22333. Some of you may have already done this. Um, and then uh, to respond to the question, please choose your answer, yes or no, and text it to 22333. And ev everyone's answer will be anonymous. We spent years thinking through this, so <laughs> you only get 30 seconds. Good luck. <laughs> okay, are we good? Okay. So clearly we have a tough conversation ahead of us. Um, this isn't a question that, as I mentioned, is, is new to our community. Um, and I, I, I do think that there's no better, better panel suited than this one. Um, they know the region really well through different times of conflict and transition and uh, political kind of environments. Um, and I think that's really important when looking at the issue of Afghanistan, that we see it from a multi-dimensional perspective, not just kind of from the military perspective, if you will. Um, we have Candice Rondeau with us. She's a professor of practice um, at, and a senior fellow at Arizona State University. Yanni Koskinas, who's a senior fellow here uh, with New America uh, in the International Security Program and CEO of the Hoplite Group, and uh, Ambassador Robin Rafel, who's a senior associate um, at the Project on Prosperity and Development at CSIS. Um, and just, just for kind of reference and to put it, this issue in the current context, um, recently in the New York Times, former National Security Advisor Susan Rice uh, wrote an op-ed which said, President Trump needs to acknowledge that the longest war will go on much longer. And some of you may have seen a BBC report that uh, noted that the Taliban fighters are present in over 70% of the country. And there's also a growing sense amongst experts and analysts that the war in Afghanistan is unwinnable. Now all of these impressions that are out there in our kind of mainstream political culture would suggest that Afghanistan is already lost. And so that, that's, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And when I, I, I talked to all of the panelists before, and they, they all have very different views on this, but they all started with the same kind of sentiment that this is a country of so many million people and we have to think about it in much more in depth. And so I appreciate that. And I, I'd like to start with Candace, who'd spent several years living in Kabul as the Washington Post Bureau Chief. And um, she has a really good kind of on the ground take on this question. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough question because, you know, uh, there's always a temptation to, to go back and kind of rehash, um, you know, the elements of the conflict. And I think, you know, most people in this audience kind of know the elements. Um, we're at a stage now where we hear you know, not just, you know, analysts and experts talking about, um, you know, the need for political settlement. We just heard today, you know, uh, even General McConville make reference to the fact that political settlement is something that, uh, has to be prioritized uh, at some stage. Um, so I think we're at that stage now. Uh, I think we've been probably at that stage for a couple of years. We weren't, um, I think, uh, a few years ago when some of the initial attempts um, to sort of elevate the conversation with the Taliban, um, you know, with the opening of the office in Doha and so forth, uh, we weren't there, um, you know, in 2012 for lots of different reasons. Um, but it, it is certainly time to talk and it's, it's definitely uh, time to get ready to talk. Um, and what that means is, you know, for the United States, what it means is really prioritizing 
um, you know, setting up a negotiating team, um, making sure that they understand sort of the, the parameters, the objectives, um, the interests of the United States, uh, and what's achievable uh, in, you know, a given circumstance, given capacity, uh, given the, the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan today, uh, and also on the other side of the border, of course, in Pakistan. Um, you know, and then we come to Pakistan, where I think, you know, uh, it's clear that Pakistan needs to get ready to talk, too. Um, and, you know, for Pakistan, that may mean uh, relinquishing to some degree uh, some of its commitments to um, using the Taliban to solve its tariff and trade problems, uh, to solve its water management problems, to, to solve its uh, border problems. Um, to the degree possible, um, they really have to start looking at uh, diplomatic engagement as, as the first track um, toward solving those problems as opposed to uh, funding the insurgency um, across the border. Uh, and then for the Taliban, um, I mean, I think there's a really serious question um, for them. That, uh, years ago, when I was working for the International Crisis Group, um, you know, I was asked to do a report on you know, the state of negotiations or the prospect of a political settlement. Um, and the one thing I came away with uh, then I, that I still think applies uh, today, uh, you know, five years later, six years later, um, is that the Taliban do not yet have the capacity um, to act as honest negotiators at the table. Uh, we've seen, you know, uh, you know, the efforts in Doha. Um, we've seen um, various sort of um, moments in Paris where we've had, or in, in Beijing, uh, in China, uh, Japan as well, where we've had Taliban representatives come forward um, to negotiate or at least begin discussions uh, on de-escalating the conflict um, but they're not, they're not open, uh, they're not honest, um, and they're not um, real about their own commitments. Um, I think it may be that the Taliban uh, currently lack the capacity um, to engage politically, but they need to be encouraged now um, that this is actually a political conversation. It's no longer just a military conversation, although, um, as I was discussing a little bit with Robin last night, um, you know, there is sort of a mill-to-mill -mill engagement that also needs to happen. Uh, so the table, um, I think everybody agrees that now there's a table <laughs> uh, and that, you know, there's a need to sit around the table. The shape of the table uh, is more or less, I think, agreed on, which is to say uh, there are a number of stakeholders, uh, regional as well as internal stakeholders, who need to be at that table. Uh, most importantly, there also needs to be a team of negotiators for all of those stakeholders who are prepared to speak on behalf of their given organizations and interests. Uh, at this stage, the Taliban are really the, the weakest link uh, in that regard. Um, they need to come out of the shadows um, and sit at the table properly. Thank you, Candice. Uh, Yanni, I'd be interested in your take on the question, but also in reaction to Candice's comments. You spend a, a good amount of your time in Kabul currently, so I'd be um, curious to hear your take on if the Taliban is ready to negotiate, should we negotiate with them, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, uh, to answer the question, I, I don't think that uh, Afghanistan is lost, um, but more importantly, I think Afghanistan is winnable. Uh, it's, we have to define what winning is about. Uh, I think if you start with the basic construct of maintaining a uh, safe, uh, environment in Afghanistan uh, to the point or some sort of balance that, that does not allow um, terror groups to operate out of there, uh, that's about as good as we're going to get in, in the near term. So that's in somehow uh, a, a winning, um, you know, stabilization uh, platform that we should be aiming towards. The unfortunate thing is that terrorist groups are operating out of Afghanistan and we have to maintain the, uh, the effort there uh, for quite a bit longer than perhaps we're willing to accept right off the bat. Um, and, and that's part of the, the, the challenge that I would throw out to, to the audience and to the policy um, uh, groups that may be uh, paying attention to this. We need to stop looking for silver bullets, you know, the, the fast track to losing weight the easy way of, of uh, becoming, you know, the, the, you know, gaining back the hair that you lost. All these things are not gonna happen, okay? When it comes to Afghanistan, this is gonna take a long time. Um, the Taliban, with respect, I don't think are remotely 
ready to, to talk the talk we want. Uh, they're not prepared to address um, the, the topics that we want them to address. They are focused on regime change. The, the, they are focused on changing what they consider is a puppet government in Kabul. Uh, they are focused on um, any, by any means necessary, which means you know throwing bodies, they don't care, they're not tired, they're not having recruitment issues no matter what we want to say because the fact is the attacks are continuing, the attacks are ongoing, so um, the, the violence levels remain at extreme levels. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't see the facts sort of laying out. Now I'm not suggesting, because I think Candace is exactly right, we should maintain a dialogue, a mechanism of talking, but I just want the expectation management to stay realistic in the sense that this isn't gonna get us there. So when General McConville says, um, look, we're helping them to lower their casualties um, so they can actually you know, reach a negotiated, negotiated settlement, that's not tomorrow. That's not you know, a year from now. That's not even three years from now. Um, so it's somewhere out there. It's like, you know, uh, there was, used to be a joke with, with uh, uh, army soldiers getting in a 15 patch van and the, and the joke would be, you know, how many, how many army soldiers do you fit in, our, in a 15 patch van? And the answer is one more. You know, it's not 15. So, so we need to make sure that we don't put these, you know, kind of parameters around, unrealistic parameters because it gets us in trouble. And if I may, I'll just throw out some facts real quick, and then I, know I want to toss it over to, to uh, Robin, obviously. Um, 2017, we, were, we started this new strategy, okay? The new strategy of supposedly no timelines, condition-based, all this other stuff. But the reality is we have conditions, you know? And we're not meeting those conditions, and the timelines are gonna creep up on us. We have 2018 parliamentary elections that were supposed to be held in 2015. We have 2018 midterm elections here that may change the dynamics in Congress. We have 2019 presidential elections in Afghanistan. If they are held as on time, that is about the time that we're starting the presidential season for the U.S. here. So things can change. President Trump made a choice, perhaps not even his first choice, of inserting more troops and supporting the mission in Afghanistan, that can change. So I'll leave this portion of the talk, and I hope obviously the questions come, uh, by saying we have to meet return on investment at every turn, because the timing is crucial and the clock is ticking. Um, I think what's in apparent in Candace's views and then what Yanni said was that there's this intense debate going on, and it has been going on for a while over um, whether you can talk and fight at the same time. And we've never truly, within the policy establishment, I don't think we've truly reconciled ourselves to kind of which approach to pursue, and there have been fits and starts. Um, so you summed that up really nicely. And also, um, I appreciate your comment on kind of the political cycle, both in the region and also in the United States. Um, I think many of us feel that the previous kind of attempts to negotiate have been hijacked, if you will, mm -hmm. um, or uh, you know, overtaken by political events that, which I think is normal in foreign policy, but it's just, I think it needs to be said. So with that, um, allow me to turn over to Ambassador Rafel, who has some very nuanced and um, honest views about how we might actually start having these kinds of conversation, uh, conversations, but also just in general on the question. We'd like to hear your take. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shamila. Well, on the basic question of whether Afghanistan is lost, I would agree with the other panelists, no, it's not lost, unless you think that the definition of lost is a failure to uh, totally defeat the Taliban. That's not gonna happen. So, so uh, if, if that's your definition, then uh, I would say Afghanistan is lost. But I don't think that's the right question. I think the really the right question is how you re-energize efforts towards a political process so that Afghanistan can move forward uh, to a political resolution of this conflict. We all say, or almost everyone says, there's no military solution, but we have thus far failed uh, to really act decisively on that 
that perspective, on that point of view, that there is no military solution. So what do we need to do to move forward? Um, first of all, we need to be much more dispassionate and honest with ourselves about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, the current structure of the Afghan government and the Constitution is not perfectly suited. Uh, there are definitely some adjustments that could and need to be made there. The Taliban, as distasteful as it is and its policies are, are part of Afghan society. They do have some real support in certain parts of the country. So further demonizing them uh, only makes it more difficult to launch a peace proce process, and we can't really bludgeon the Taliban uh, to the negotiating table. I think we need to be honest with ourselves that there are, are elements in Afghanistan who benefit from the status quo. There's a war economy, a lot of people are making a lot of money, and we need to be aware of that. Um, we need to be aware that we can't really fast forward the development of Afghanistan with money alone. We've thrown a lot of money at this problem. The result has been a lot of, of uh, corruption and, as we say, the uh, war economy. So we need to really redefine in our own minds, certainly with the help of the Afghans, what is the center of gravity of the body politic in Afghanistan? That's where we start, and how do we move forward from there uh, towards a p political process? We need to be aware that Pakistan has legitimate security interests in Afghanistan. Pakistan is not out to destabilize Afghanistan. Their concern is primarily about what India is doing there, the whole issue of, of facing India on two fronts. You can say what you want about that, what, how legitimate it is, but in the Pakistani mind, it's clear. Uh, we have to recognize that this conflict is multi-layered. There's the internal aspect to it, the political internal uh, Afghan parties, but there are also the regional aspects, Pakistan, India, Central Asia, Iran, and then there's the international aspect, the coalition, the United States, Europeans, China, and so on. So it's complicated and there are many levels, and that means that the overall resolution on the political side cannot be Afghan-led. You need some kind of third party to help bring all of these multiple levels together uh, in a political process. And finally, I'd say we need to recognize that time is not on our side. The more time that goes by, uh, the more insurgent groups that get involved. In the beginning, it was the Taliban. Now you've got ISIS. And as our military commanders say, there are 20 other groups there as well. Uh, and you've also got other governments involved. You've got Iran, you've got Russia, China. Everybody's looking to their interests now. Uh, so it gets more complicated as time goes by. So the sooner the better. Um, and I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you, Robin. Um, Candice, from your vantage point of being somebody who has reported from Kabul for several years during a time when the conflict was fairly intense, um, how would you look at this issue of negotiations with respect to what Robin just said about the role that Pakistan has to play or that has played historically and their interests? Yeah, that's a good question. I, first, I want to second uh, Robin's point on, on uh, the, the need for a third party uh, interlocutor to, to manage the process of trying to reach a political settlement. Um, I also want to address Gianni's uh, points as well. You know, as per sort of where the political settlement you know, lies today and whether the Taliban are ready, yes, it's clear they're not ready. Uh, but the point is to get ready, right? And so uh, we can imagine that this, this, like the process in Ireland, like the process in Colombia, um, is going to take many, many years now that there seems to be a general consensus uh, that political settlement is something that we must reach at some stage or another. Um, you know, we should expect that, like Colombia, like Ireland, um, we're going to spend another five, 10 years uh, trying to reach that settlement and that it will have multiple parts and it will not look like Dayton at all. Um, so having said that, on the Pakistan um, question, um, you know, it, it is also true that India uh, and the rivalry with India is, is absolutely critical to understanding the tensions. Um, but it's also important to understand the historical tensions between Pakistan and Afghanistan over the borders. 
Um, you know, we tend to kind of, you know, get involved in the sort of thinking, you know, deep thoughts about India and, and Russia and all these other larger players. Um, but the border issue between Afghanistan and Pakistan is quite serious, and it has been since 1973, actually since 1948. Um, you know, that, that historical um, dividing of what would be called Pashtunistan, um, you know, has led to a, a lot of strife uh, in both sides of the border. And um, so, you know, there's, I think, a need to sort of prioritize that in a very pragmatic way in the diplomacy um, there are some very tactical steps that uh, any team, you know, whether it's a U.S. team or another, is going to have to grapple with. Um, and I, I would say that the first thing that needs to happen is just attend the borders. Uh, that means um, really grappling with the issue of water management, uh, which is a very serious issue uh, that, uh, you know, that Afghanistan has yet to solve. Uh, by that, you might be able to sort of stand up a, a commission, a joint commission, a quadrilateral commission, between the bordering states where there are these challenges, Iran, Tajikistan, uh, Pakistan, uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, the water issue is serious and it is what drives a lot of the conflict. Uh, so lastly, on the, on the border issue, I think you're gonna have to talk about the transit of people uh, and goods. Uh, and we know that the Afghanistan-Pakistan trade and tariff agreement is not yet complete in many ways. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there. Uh, it has to be treated seriously um, as part of this pragmatic, appro pragmatic approach to diplomacy. Um, but for the, the Taliban, um, really, you know, we gave them an office. It's now for the time for them to also give us a point of contact. Um, it's really critical that they, they assign a point of contact for civilian casualty issues and that that person is not Zabiullah Mujahid, okay? Um, it's really important that uh, we have somebody assigned for water management and border issues um, and that person is not Zabiullah Mujahid. Uh, it's really important that returnees and refugees um, have a representative and that person is not Zabiullah Mujahid. It's lastly most important that on constitutional and electoral issues and political participation uh, for which the Taliban cries out, whether they imagine an emirate or not, um, their representative cannot be Zabiullah Mujahid. Uh, it's time for them to come out of the shadows and begin taking ownership uh, of their, their political ideology and stop killing people uh, you know, with, with this sort of emptiness of, uh, of their sort of political content. Thank you. Um, and one final follow-up question for Yanni before we open it up to the audience. Um, both Robin and Candace focused a lot on process and policy and the kind of the technical um, aspects of negotiations. But Candace ended her remarks with kind of a nod to something else, which is the sentiment amongst the public and how people feel about the Taliban as representatives of the Afghan people or as members of the government, given all of this kind of brutal history that we've, we've witnessed. And so because Yanni lives in Kabul most of the year, I want him to give us a sense of what is life like in Kabul right now? What are Afghans thinking about when they think about the Taliban potentially coming back into positions of power and negotiating with the government? Uh, first of all, they're terrified. Uh, I think the people I talk to, not just in Kabul, but elsewhere, are, are really scared with some of our, um, quite frankly, irresponsible conversations. Um, the notion that, that somehow, some way, Everybody in D.C. and, and unfortunately it reverbs you know, to, to the other spots around the planet is talking about this, you know, every article talks about reconciliation as the answer. Every article, you know, talks about it's time to make a deal with the Taliban. No matter, not with the nuance that, that Candace has thrown out, but, but with this sort of, you know, bullet statement, time to make a deal. And they're worried immensely over this because they think that's our get out of here uh, event. You know, that's the, the helicopters on top of the Saigon, uh, you know, embassy. That's, that's, that's to them a, an abandonment message. Um, and let's be honest also about this. Um, uh, we, we have an example of so-called reconciliation, that, of irresponsible reconciliation. When you bring in Gulbuddin Hekmatyar into Afghanistan, a guy that was uh, responsible for enormous damage, not to say that others have not been responsible for enormous damage that in fact may be part of the government or may in fact 
but they've reconciled and joined the government. This guy has come back and is trying to displace a Hezbollah party that has been part of the Afghan process and assume once again his messianic sort of leadership role, which was in no small part, part of the problem that drove us to civil war in the 90s. So we, we are so, we appear, whether or not we really are, it is a subject for another debate, but we appear desperate to make this deal. And, and quite frankly, that's a desperation that comes out to the Afghans. It, they, they, they hedge their bets. Um, people uh, that may be corrupt figure that I'm gonna eat as much as I possibly can right now because the time is, is cut, you know, getting loose. People think, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, wh however hard I try, I'm not gonna, you know, get to, to a realistic spot because everybody wants to make a deal. So I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make with this particular thing is we, again, I'm a theme guy, so return on investment has to be, you know, where we're delivering on some of the promises that we're making and also being realistic. Uh, a acceptable sort of situation in Afghanistan for us is not going to happen through Peshawar, Islamabad, Ralpindi, New Delhi, any of these places. It's going to happen by strengthening the Afghan government and creating a circumstance there that they can fend for themselves. That is the only answer. The rest of it is, as far as I'm concerned, icing. Okay, I lied because I want to ask Robin one, I want to give you a chance to follow up. I want to ask you one more thing related to this. What do you do with this kind of sentiment as a diplomat if you were constructing these negotiations? Surely these, these views would be part of, it would be a consideration for negotiators. Could you comment on that? Absolutely, of course they are, but I think they represent Kabul and not the totality of Afghanistan. Uh, secondly, I would say that the Afghan people, I think, are as angry with their government almost as they are with the Taliban, because this is a mess. They don't feel secure. All, uh, you know, which, what Yanni says is true, but it's partly uh, a problem of the governance uh, issue as well as the insurgency. A uh, couple of other things. One, Candace is absolutely right about bilateral uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan issues. My understanding is that the, the two governments are engaged on a lot of these issues now and should be encouraged uh, to move forward and, and try to resolve some of them, and we should help as we can if, if asked. And then finally, I would say the Taliban is more ready for negotiations, I believe, than is widely perceived. Uh, not perfectly ready, and they're certainly the weaker uh, of all the parties in terms of their ability to, you know, understand how you con construct negotiations and so on and so forth. But I do think they're more ready. I think their statement of the 14th of February was more than just a message to the Afghan people, and that we need to build on that, and we need to build on the Ghani outreach um, uh, to the Taliban in his speech in Kabul. And what diplomatically the U.S. should be doing is engaging with all these groups and trying to push towards a consensus, uh, uh, push people together rather than say, well, if the Taliban doesn't respond or isn't up to it, you know, that proves uh, they shouldn't participate. So You've all just witnessed what it feels like to be in every NSC meeting on AFPAC <laughs> for the past 10 years. So. <laughs> um, so let's open it up. We have just a few minutes for questions and uh, for, for the panelists. And we have mic runners going around. So Peter. Comment and question. The comment is, I think the United States has sort of made a category error that the, the panel helps elucidate, which is we have focused way too much on the question of reconciliation, which as Candace said, might take, you know, might be Northern Ireland standards, might be, you know, it took 50 years with the FARC. This is going to be a long time. We have this date certain for this election, which may be delayed 2019. If this election does not go well, uh, I think our, you know, our, our commitment to Afghanistan, including with the president and, and other uh, policymakers, is going to be hard to sustain. If, it's as, if the election goes as badly as the previous two, 
we have a major problem. With the, and the, and if, if we want real national reconciliation in Afghanistan, a free and fair election that is somewhat accepted by the people will go much further than some deal with the Taliban that might be 10 years from now. So that's, that's a comment. The, the question is, you, you, we mentioned we need a third party. Who is the third party in these negotiations? And, and as part of this deal, you know, I think it's not widely understood that the Afghans themselves do not recognize the 1893 Durand line that is the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is enormously paradoxical because they're always complaining about Pakistan you know, incursions into their country. If they can't recognize this international boundary, how can you possibly have a deal? And is it possible for Afghan policymakers to actually come to the table with that as a potential uh, deal uh, point? Thank you. Candice? Um, very good points, Peter. Uh, so there's no probably one entity um, that can serve as a third party. Obviously, the UN you know, has some capacity in that regard uh, and should be looked at as sort of a, a first port of call, at least in terms of um, managing the process to some degree. I think that's going to be really important. Um, but on the border issue, actually, and this is actually, you know, um, it points up some of the complexity of trying to um, both set the table um, and then make sure everybody gets something to eat along the way, um, you'll need another interlocutor, and that will be the International Court of Justice. Uh, from my point of view, at this stage, the, the, the challenge around the dispute over the border is so severe um, that, in fact, it has to be solved by a third party. There may be some track two uh, things that can be done uh, along the way to an, an ICJ um, intervention, but uh, you know, we've seen recently with Pakistan and India um, an ICJ uh, judgment around uh, water use and border issues, um, you know, from a, a dispute that's been going on for, since 1965, um, and whether or not Pakistan really, you know, uh, adheres to all of that, nonetheless, the judgment is there. Um, we've got to have some sort of bright lines, and unfortunately, none of the parties uh, at the table are really capable of setting those bright lines, so we will need probably different avenues of third party uh, interlocutors to kind of intervene at various points. We have time for one more question. Yep, he's coming. Chris Miller, Air Force Academy. I'm curious whether the uh, introduction of the, the advise and assist concept uh, is being positively or negatively perceived by the Afghan security forces, the, uh, the Afghans as a whole, and the Taliban, your perceptions on that. I can, I can, if that's all right. Um, um, first of all, it's it's long overdue. I think it, it should have happened a while ago. Um, uh, unfortunately, the announcement came, you know, that we're going to do this last year. And as you know, the um, uh, first uh, advisory brigade just arrived. Um, so I think we need to give them a little bit of time. But unfortunately, you know, they're they're running right into the. Uh, uh, the second poppy season is done, and they're, you know, we're about to get get started again, you know, with violence levels. Uh, so I think they have a, a tough road ahead. Um, I think the fact that we're giving them um, new aviation platforms, uh, new with bunny ears, but you know, uh, uh, aviation platforms and the advisors to to support them in that, I, I think it's immensely important and it should have happened a long time ago. So again, we have to give them um, some time for that to mature. Uh, it, it, it takes a while, but I think it's absolutely the right the right thing to do. But again, you know, and, and these panels are important and, and New America has been incredibly supportive of, of, of make, keeping this in, in the forefront. So I, I mean, it, it's definitely one of the few that still pay attention to this, quite frankly. Um, but, but, but the fact of the matter is we're talking about the Taliban, um, you know, unicorns in Pakistan and all the other stuff. And then the reality is, is that, um, we have an economy that's failing in Afghanistan uh, because partially it's it's a war economy. Uh, we have a, a, a enormous unemployment problems. Uh, we have uh, governance is not. Have we talked about governance at all in the entire panel? But it's it's an essential element of what the national unity government was supposed to be about reform and and getting ready for the next sort of elections down the road. And we've not achieved any of those milestones. So I would employ 
uh, implore everybody to, to actually pay attention for the things that we have promised that we're gonna do before we start talking about these mythical creatures that are out there called you know, reconciliation with the Taliban. And with respect, uh, Robin, it isn't just Kabul. Uh, the, the other parts of the country are even more segregated because they're, they're more socially still challenged with the, with the problems of 40 years, whereas Kabul has sort of reached some sort of uh, equalization. So with that, uh, I've sucked all the oxygen well, out of right. <laughs> no, no, you haven't, you I haven't. Just, <laughs> Robin's looking yeah. at me like she wants to. Uh, everything that Peter says about the complexity, uh, the importance of the elections and all of that is perfectly true. And all I would say is as difficult as, as those issues are, they are not beyond the mind of man to move towards resolution if we get serious about this. And US leadership in getting serious is crucial. Uh, everybody's sitting on their hands to a degree, the Afghan government, the Taliban, Pakistan, and so on, because we haven't demonstrated that we're serious. And if we do, I think we'd be surprised how we could begin to move things, and I think it's very important that this start before the election, because I think if you had a process going, it would set the stage for an election that could be more successful than the last one. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panelists for... Very interesting conversation.